Hi, this is Michael Waits, and welcome back to Insurance for the New Possible, a Chubb conversation. We are joined today by John Wusthuizen, the global digital CTO at Chubb, and John Briscoe, the CEO of Coherent. Thank you both for coming and doing this today. How are you? Very good, thank you. Good, thanks. Awesome. Let's start with a very quick self-introduction of both of you. And Johan, why don't you go first? Yeah, sure. Um, so thanks for having me. Thank you. Um, you know, so I uh, got into insurance, I think, later than most people in Chubb. Um, you know, I uh, come from South Africa, so I joined Chubb in 2016. Okay. Um, a solution architect, um, you know, by study and by, by trade. But, um, you know, I'm sort of a little bit of a jack of all trades um, or generalist. And I um, ended up in a a sort of my own marketing agency, digital agency in South Africa. And, you know, got introduced to Chubb in 2016. That's how we sort of started here. Um, And yeah, so used to lead APAC Digital um, from a technology perspective. You know, we were starting digital for Chubb globally. Um, You know, so we... um, uh, uh, started sort of on our journey, and uh, in that journey, you know, I've moved a couple of roles, and now sort of at the global level, doing the same thing for the globe as I did for APAC. Sounds great, John. Yeah, and again, Michael and Johan, thank you for, for uh, giving me the chance to be on the show today. Uh, my journey, I, I created Coherent around about five years ago, uh, and that was after a fifteen-year career, mostly in insurance where I've got to travel the world as well. We're working nearly in every continent with some of the largest insurers in the world uh, solving quite complex technology and operations problems. Uh, and that's been on both the life side as well as the PNC side. So know the good, the bad and the ugly around the industry. Uh, but then also that led to myself when I did create the business, taking some of that experiences from the industry into hopefully creating solutions which the industry can embrace. So it's been a, a good journey and looking forward to talking about it today. I cannot wait to talk about solutions in the context of digital. That is perfect. Let's talk about some of the challenges and opportunities around being able to work. Both of you mentioned global. Right, let's talk about some of the challenges, but the opportunities about being able to work with a global team and global partners in the context of growth. How does this work? Johan, can we start with you? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, you know, the opportunities, um, you know, really when you've got a global connected team, you know, we all know technology have brought us all together uh, a lot closer over the last couple of years and made, you know, global seem a lot smaller than what it used to be. Sure. Um, but still, I feel the, the reason why, you know, some, some guys find massive value in it is, you know, being able to understand different cultures, different markets, um, you know, different opportunities in one market uh, might actually open doors in another. Um, you know, so for us, um, having a global footprint, having consistency at a global level, have really been able to help us, you know, identify partners that are the same, um, you know, where we can provide a consistent kind of solution for them. Um, across different markets, um, while still, you know, really respecting uh, the the intricacies of a local market and the 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 special um, you know cultures that exist, because um, every market is is different. Um, there's very few of our markets that's exactly the same. However, there's parallels between some of them. Um, you know, where uh, Indonesia might actually look a lot like South Africa, um, as an example, with an up-and-coming middle class, um, you know, huge internet penetration. Um, you know, so there's certain things that works in different markets, Latin America as well. Right. Um, so we see the opportunities sort of coming from some of those areas where, you know, something that works in a market in Asia um, doesn't always work in Europe, but, you know, having the teams all connected, it opens doors potentially for something in Latin America. So we all learn, um, you know, there's new technologies in different regions as well. Um, and ultimately, I believe, you know, it creates for just a stronger team, you know, so that's more globally connected. So, yeah, that, that's been working for us. It, it's, it's not always easy, um, you know, traveling as much as John does, I know. Um, you know, it's not easy, um, but, you know, the, the value is far outweighs the cons. John? Yeah, look, I think if you look at what Johan's been talking about from a Chubb context, look, I think Chubb's in like 70 to 100 countries globally, and you imagine the diversity of teams, partners, and therefore the how you have to manage that uh, is obviously 
extreme in a large organization but even for a small organization it's exactly the same we have now a globally diverse team because we were built really through the kind of covid period uh, right. so therefore we had to essentially hire anyone who was willing to join the company to be perfectly frank and we were willing to take them anywhere but then how do you build a culture and how do you build a way of working when people don't get the chance to meet each other on a regular basis right. and i think this is where uh, actually uh, great businesses try and figure that out where even though people aren't working on daily basis face to face on whiteboards but can still produce outcomes and solutions that requires a specific dna but a belief as to what you're trying to do right? so what do you do from the top of the organization to build that company culture this idea of and and to again enhance mm. the growth not just of your business but of the business that you're providing solutions for as well right yeah that's hard i i think first and foremost and uh, I'm sure Johan will agree, agree with me as well, is whatever your team is working on, they have to believe what you're working on. Does it have essentially a purpose and a value which you're trying to drive towards? Because right. if it doesn't, guess what? People aren't going to stay and they're not going to be committed to working. And like it's, it's hard working on, on Teams calls or Zoom calls or WebEx calls if you're not believing in what you're trying to do. So my job in my company is to make sure that people believe about what we're trying to do as an organization and that the product and capabilities are actually adding value. I think that's, that's imperative to success. And Johan, can I ask you this? So we come out of COVID, right? Because you mentioned it, it was a very interesting time, not just to build things, but to hire people, particularly because you couldn't meet them face to face. But now that we're out of that, what do we take that we've learned from there and how does it change the way we work in these globally distributed teams over the next five years? In other words, what would you like to see? If you could imagine something new, what would it be and how would you work it? Yeah, I mean, that's really interesting. I think, um, you know, having come from a technology background, you know, we always hope for the the kind of uh, environments like COVID where we are able to work from home. Right. I mean, and then we started missing the office so much. You know, so I think the uh, the one thing that's really positive from it, um, you know, is you put more effort into culture, you know, uh, to be able to make everybody realize that to make um, working from home or, um, you know, working remotely or, you know, just at a hybrid kind of level to make it work for the team, um, you know, you need to put in more effort that sometimes you would not have done if you were just based in the office. Right. So companies, uh, you know, like Chubb and like, you know, some of our teams, um, you know, we, we really went out to try and you know, build a little bit more culture and get people together. I, I'm with John with this as well, that, you know, you can have the best of all of those things, but if the vision is not something that teams believe in and the clarity of that vision is not super clear, um, you know, then you lose people. It's, uh, I think as soon as you, uh, and when I say lose people, you, you lose the efficiency of people that, um, you know, uh, that you would need to be successful. So for us, um, I guess, you know, really having that North Star and everybody aligning to, you know, where where's the direction where we're going? Um, you know, if you don't have that, um, it, it starts feeling very uncomfortable, anxious. You know, everybody feels like they, they're just running circles. Right. And in digital, to be honest, that's part of the game is, you know, having that little bit of uncomfortable kind of moments um, where we don't know what the answer is. I don't know what we need to know for next year. Um, but that's part of the, the process. You learn to cope with that. And I think that's what COVID really did for us. It, it actually pulled most of our teams closer together. Fair enough. Um, you know, so it, and it opened a lot of doors for people as well. To be honest. John, do you have fiscal offices? We do have some, yes. Uh, but we're in a, I have staff in a lot of countries where there's obviously no physical office. Right. Yeah. But do you see yourself as you continue to grow and get bigger? building physical offices in more spaces. I'm just really curious about what that future looks like and what that hybrid looks like. I think it's partly dictated by the, obviously the experience of what employees want as well. Right? Yeah, fair enough. Uh, I, I, like, it's no secret that our business has grown really fast in the United States, as an example. And I think we have essentially 24 different states where we have employees. Uh, and therefore, the me forcing everyone to go and work out of our New York office, right. which is our corporate HQ now, that's unrealistic. Right. So I've got to search for where the talent for the business is 
and be ready to kind of meet them halfway around essentially what do they want to do, where do they want to live, but can they provide the value and experience which we need as a business? Yep. And, then, and then really harness people who are in the office with people who are outside. Mm-hmm. So uh, there's certain organisations, obviously I think it's well publicised, that the banks are trying to force a lot of people back into back, the, yeah. right? And, and I, I do understand that maybe in some large corporates that that, that, that is kind of key, but in the type of business that we're operating we, we have to trust our team to be able to work off, off site. Yeah. Yeah. Let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about digital and digital transformation. And I think every industry goes through this and I don't think there's an order, right? We can say this industry is late. This industry is early. I don't really believe that, but insurance is having its moment. And I'm curious if you think anyone right now at this point, and I'll go to you first, Johan talks about legacy tech as much as insurance. And can you talk about, like what can actually be done to fix this, disintermediate this, what's real, what's not real? Just talk to me about this. Yeah, I guess, you know, it's like, uh, how can I put it? It's almost like a, a old pair of slippers, right? But it's very comfortable. You're used to them. You know, it's it's something that you you got used to and it's something that you love actually as well. Right. You know, so legacy technology, you know, sometimes do get a, a really bad rap when you when you look at it from a transformation angle. Um, you know, so I think the the reality is that the guys that that ultimately you know gets to transform, um, where transformation is sort of natural, um, are the guys that that knows where to respect legacy. Meaning, you know, certain things in legacy was done a certain way, and they work really well, um, and they work well. Um, the key, however, is whenever you do look at some of these transformational um, you know sort of programs, is not to build your your requirements based on the old, and that's what you know. I think a lot of guys that comes from the legacy environment, um, you know, when they look at requirements, they look at it from a lens of that legacy and what they know. So this is a really important point, actually. Can you dig a little bit deeper into that? Not to base your transformation on the old, but how do you separate that? Right, those thoughts of this is how we've done it. Now let's turn it into digital because you have this opportunity to really transform and say this was the process before. But because we have access to new technology, we can do it differently. Can you talk about maybe one or two pain points that you've had and some solutions you've had as well? Yeah, I, I guess one important point is, um, again, you know, the reality is that it's not always the technology play at all. The, the biggest piece of the transformation you know, that, that we've seen is changing people, meaning you know, sunken cost fallacy as right. an example. Right. Um, you know, would you rather stay in something old that, everybody sort of believes is wrong, but it's easy, it's comfortable. You know, nobody raises massive um, issues with it. It's always you know, been there. It's been there, you know, so you, you, you stick around with it, um, you know, or take the hard route and sort of say, listen, guys, the, 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 this does not work for us. And you might irritate people because we spent two, three million dollars on it or right. 20, 30 million dollars on it. I think the, the key is in the, the technology leadership, you know, the guys that's got the guts to be able to, um, that's brave enough to identify those and know when to say, listen, so certain vessels, um, you know, might have been, um, you know, good enough to get us to where we are today. For us to go from this canoe to a speedboat, um, we can't turn a canoe into a speedboat. Um, you know, so it's maybe not about transformation as much as it is, you know, changing vessels, um, you know, especially where technology from 20 years ago to t- technology today um, for any engineering kind of guys would know how much it's changed, how the pace have changed, how easier it's become to develop things and get it out. It's night and day. It's it's now not a case of, you know, we used to start off with, you know, what should we build and, you know, how are we building it for many years? We are now at that stage where the question should really be, should we be building this? Right. Um, you know, and um, it, it sparks different questions. But again, as soon as you can get past some of the, the mentality changes and transformation that's required, um, you know, I always feel that, you know, the, dig- the digital transformation will happen automatically, um, you know, and I think in Chubb that we're very lucky that I think that has happened for us. Um, you know, I, I come from a legacy environment, used to be a Microsoft uh, architect, so I, I supported big enterprises and I, I know all the, the ins and outs of those systems, but you need to respect those to be able to move to the new as well. You mm-hmm. can't just say, you know, uh, th- this was all wrong and we just jump over to the new. There's 
sunken cost is maybe not sunken cost. It might be an investment to get you to where you are today. Right. So it's <coughs> how do you look at things that I think is ultimately crucial. That's a great answer. John, do you want to look at this from the opposite perspective? Because you're providing the solutions to people that actually want to, and again, not necessarily only use technology, excuse me, only use technology to digitally transform, but they're looking for places to take the pain points that you address and then use your solutions to fix them. Can you talk about a couple of those specifically? Yeah, I, I certainly can, Michael. I, I think it's, it's, you have made a really good point around that people in organization don't deliberately try to be complex. Right. Uh, and the reality is, though, if you look at the insurance industry, it probably has more PhDs and master's graduates than any other industry in the I world. I think this is heavily under-advertised, by the way. Uh, Sorry. You've got essentially, obviously, computing scientists, you have mathematicians, actuaries, right. underwriters with years of experience. So who are trained and programmed to solve complexity because of the nature of the products and the industry, right? right? So that has been the sort of manifestation of why the legacy technology environment exists. At the time of when the technologies came in, it was probably the right decision. And it was also pretty amazingly well built, yeah, right? Yeah, but for sure. the world moves on, as does the, the kind of the need for consumers and partners and distributors. So therefore what it's done is then layer on add-ons or, or workarounds right. to try and solve for that complexity. And right. That was the opportunity our business saw around right. the fact is the industry is always moving forward. It's always looking for innovative ideas and solutions. But at the same time, it can't fix everything. So how can you create some capabilities which can attack pain points which are just existent? Uh, our capabilities solving particular areas around processes and models which get used within insurers. But it's because... That, that it would take years for these insurers to be able to kind of solve it themselves. So accelerants to solve problems which are always there are always going to be embraced by the industry, as well as obviously the industry will always look for ways to complement old with new in order to try and get outcomes overall. Right. And, and that's the way how to win because you can't transform everything. That's no, but it almost reality. has to happen, right? In other words, you can't, you said changing vessels, which I thought was a really interesting concept, but you can't get people off of this ship onto this ship in one fell swoop. Okay. First of all, because this thing's still going forward, so it has its own level of inertia. Yep. And second, they're both moving really quickly. Yep. So it has to be, I don't want to say a gradual process, mm. but a moderated process, for sure. Do you want to give maybe a specific example of a problem you saw and a solution you had to solve that problem? Well, I, th I think, obviously, the, the area which we specialize in, just the, the usage of spreadsheets within the, within the industry. But is it really like that still? So tons of Excel spreadsheets? Because I worked with them. I, I know what that's like. Michael, I, I, it would shock you how many <laughs> spreadsheets that are in existence. Uh, I could probably list, uh, uh, you, you talk about millions of spreadsheets which are operating across the industry. Interesting. And important to the industry. And the reason why is they've had to be kind of essentially the evolving nature of how the industry works, right? But also we use them because we could customize something really quick Correct. and really fast on our desk without asking anybody else for help, right? It's powerful. Yeah, it's and, super powerful. And like Microsoft have been geniuses of the way they've created this. Right. But then how do you power and codify that in order to help the industry take advantage of that? that that's basically what we saw as the opportunity. Right. And then, like anything, we're, we're not saying we replace lots of technologies. We complement what the insurers are trying to do. Right. And I think that's a very strong sort of way of how technology evolves, not the rip and replace, because the industry has probably realized that's never really been a good This play. was the conversation we were just having about yeah. vessels, yeah, right? Yeah. So how do you complement decisions which have been made? Yep in order to make sure those previous investments are better, but also the investment you're making in some of the technologies like we have or others have can actually produce the ROI which organizations need. Got it. Makes perfect sense. Did you want to add something? Yeah, Please. I think, uh, again, to accelerant kind of utility tools like, um, you know, um, coherence tools uh, is exactly that. It, it makes up, you know, with the, the power that it brings to the table for, you know, maybe some of the investments that, you know, was still in something that was old, that was not new. Um, now, bringing in some of these things into the equation of transformation, um, you know, and accelerating certain pieces, not trying to, having to accelerate the whole thing, um, but you can solve for some of the, the major pain points, um, you know, is, I think it's very powerful. It, it also makes it a lot more feasible to achieve, you know, yeah, because for I sure. think... Um, a lot of these programs are so big and so heavy that, that sometimes... You know, it, it, the, the program itself, you know, overpowers the value of what it's supposed to bring to the table. It, it becomes the, the thing. That becomes um, the problem, actually, in a yeah, way. Right? And we're, you know, ultimately, we should not even 
really have to mm. you know be focused on <laughs> this anymore it's just everybody here that is in our company you know we it's natural we we already on that journey whether we like it or not um it's you know yes we've got certain programs to accelerate in certain markets and do some changes on it um but i think that's the key is uh, how, how you how you look at it in the bigger picture of not for the next two years or three years if you look 2030 and back um you know what would it look like uh, what does it need to look like right and i think that's that's the important piece would you say that digital transformation i think one of you said earlier it doesn't have to come from the top down it's just going to happen naturally as more like when nobody gave me a spreadsheet and said okay now do all your work there <laughs> it was just there and i thought i can do some pretty amazing things with this and it's kind of the same thing you were saying now that that's there and there are tons of them, how can we institutionalize them and make them more robust and then solve the problems there at scale so that this incredible thing that was created in Montreal can now be used in Barcelona, mm -hmm. that type of thing, right? Okay, let's talk about embedded insurance. And we talk about it a lot, right? But let's talk about it some more. And Johan, I want to start with you. What from the world of embedded insurance can be translated or transformed into more traditional business lines of insurance? I, I think, again, mostly, you know, everybody would immediately jump to the technology benefits and being able to integrate with partners. But I think more it's, it's also about the, the relationship with partners is Tell more me. important of this. So okay. the, the embedding, uh, when you look at it from a technology perspective, yes, that, that is... Um, something that APIs have now made possible. You mm -hmm. know, we can share data in real time and, um, you know, we can be a journey within our partners and vice versa. Um, but the real value ultimately is that it forces two partners to work together a lot closer. Um, you know, so, and when when partners, it's the same with the vision that you believe in, as soon as partners commit to something um, like this, um, you know, and, and that's what I love about embedded sort of partnerships, is that you know you need commitment from both sides to make it work. Right. This isn't just something that we can launch and then you know we hope that it will work. Partner needs to do as much work as we do, so there's skin in the game from both sides. That belief ultimately makes it work. And uh, you know a, a lot of times when you don't have that belief in a in an initiative or a project, it becomes hard sometimes to to sort of show the value. But embedding as a concept from technology perspective again you know there's so many different ways of embedding um you know from apis and sdks and uh, widgets and who knows what um you know and and we're still finding new ones um you know till today um so that is that's obviously the the mechanism and it's great and you need to have those tools um you know to be able to to facilitate it and to make it as seamless as possible because for us, if I'm a, a big partner and I've got an app, you know, this is my holy grail. Right. This is what I'm built for. Me adding somebody else into my house, basically, um, you know, I need that whatever I add into my house to be as smooth um, and as simple and as performant as my own app. Um, and that you again, definitely don't want to trust. degrade that experience. No, definitely. When you said, you said the word trust, though. Sorry, go ahead. You said the word trust. Yeah, tr that that forms the the foundation of the trust as well. You 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 now allow me to live in inside your house. house. So I'm I'm part of your family, right? Um, you know, and and thus our relationship also changes. The dynamic of the relationship, I think, changes absolutely. Um, if it was just you, you know, having a link and sending it out, you know, it, it's a cold relationship. Right now, I'm I'm a you know I'm a tenant somewhere in your house. Right. Um, so it changes the dynamic, and I think that's the that's the value of embedding for me. That I think a lot of guys, um, obviously technology wise, great benefits and sharing a lot of data with APIs. But the the value of partners coming together, um, you know, and committing to something, I think that for me is the value. John, yeah, I, I kind of th I think a lot about what where the the world of embedding is going because obviously it's. An area which is, as you mentioned, Michael, is extremely fast growing. It's got a lot of excitement with a lot of major players. Obviously, Chubb's one of the leading players in the world on embedding insurance. But at some point, that like, what is going to be the key characteristics about who wins in the embedding insurance market, right? right. Um, and I think if you look at the lessons about non-embedded world, it's always been around quality of product, quality of relationship, 
and essentially always innovating on service. So that's why Chubb is such a been an amazing business over the last few years in terms of how it's been able to scale and grow while also having an extremely great sort of operational results as well because what most organizations probably don't want to do in embedded insurance and Johan could probably agree with this is uh, they don't want a race to the bottom you don't want to no. be picking customers just for the sake of picking customers or partners for the sake of partners so how can you learn to pick the quality customers, the quality sort of product offerings, the quality partners, which is a disciplines of what happens in the traditional side of the business. Right. I think whoever gets that right in the bedded world will probably be the winner in, in the longer term. Do you think this is a short-term bet versus a long-term bet thing? You said this, and I completely agree with you. You don't want to have every partner, and you don't want to have every customer, right? Because you want to be careful at how you choose them. You can get really big short-term gains, mm. But the best gains are the ones that are moderated and just kind of accelerate over time. Is that fair? Yeah, totally fair. I, I think, look, uh, embedded insurance and the whole um, embedded finance, to be honest, has been a little bit of what, you know, APIs and whatever were, you know, 10 years ago. Right. Um, so it's not a fad. Uh, you know, it's no. something that is real. Mm. Um, I believe the guys that are going to be 100%, um, you know, baked on it will also fail. Um, you know, so I think... You need to realize that embedded insurance is one piece of the puzzle. Um, you know, it opens doors again for other channels and for other opportunities with partners. If you only think it's going to be embedded insurance, um, you know, I think y you will have a very short list. Um, can you be successful in the short term? Of course. Right. Um, but for us again, you know, uh, uh, if you've got that longer term partnership view, um, you know, and you start to explore the potential of you know the lifetime value of a customer you know th this is one touch point it's a great touch point because it forces commitment from both sides right you know they put the effort in to make it work um you know it, it, it it's it's a win-win situation in fact it's a win-win-win situation that right. we're trying to to achieve with partners um you know so that that seemed to really resonate and work um w will that always be the 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 number one thing uh, definitely not um, and I think we were lucky. We, we were forced into, you know, really this is our model from day one. Um, in some of our markets, you know, the Chubb brand is not as strong as some of our competitors. So when we looked at it, it, it was less from just a, you know, can we have APIs in the, the actual tools? It was more about how can we scale with what we have? And the way to do that was, you know, can we integrate with some of these partners and leverage, you know, their scalability and, you know, the uh, uh, connect with some of these platforms, um, you know, and be able to hit scale that way. Um, so it was, you know, it's part of our, we, we started off this way, not because we thought this was going to be big. It was, you know, it was the only real option that we had, um, you know, going direct to consumer, although we would have loved to do it back then, but it was just never an option. Right. Um, so I think it's going to be fit for purpose. They won't be, um, you know, it's like climbing a mountain. Um, they can be, 10 guys climbing a mountain from 10 different sides. Uh, everybody should make it to the top. I think the guys that won't make it to the top that's going to run around this circle to everyone telling them they're taking the wrong path. Right. Those are the guys that's going to <laughs> yeah, struggle yeah. the most. Yeah. And the guys with the wrong equipment. And, and I think what I'd add to is actually a lesson from maybe the software industry Please. in regards to the embedded world is uh, there's always a fascination with in the insurance industry about new and new business. Right? We'll get to that too. When actually, like the software business, your best customer base is the existing customers you already have. Right? Yeah. And I look at the embedded world. I've bought some products embedded, right? It's, uh, but how do somebody, how, how will an insurer retain me moving forward right. and how will they help me grow why I want to buy from them? Because I think that's ultimately the holy grail, right? Yeah. If you can basically maximize the value of the customer you have, then what an opportunity some of the insurers like Chubb have. I, I think... If you, that is vitally important to success. I want to stay on this just a little bit longer, right? Because you both mentioned APIs, you both mentioned loyalty, and you also mentioned retention. Where does this come into play, this API <laughs> um, connectivity? And you, you said this as well. Your best customers are your existing customers. Mm -hmm. And if you can keep them in with this API connectivity, that becomes really powerful. Do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Because you mentioned it before, but I really want to dig a little bit deeper into that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, it, it's not just, I think, just due to APIs. You know, APIs are just the front door to right, get right, people right. in, right? Sure, so, sure, sure. Um, the real work and the real value comes, you know, actually when you claim, right? The, the, that's when you see the value of what we sell. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a strange product, but that is the reality. And, 
you know, so APIs provides a pathway between us and partners, you know, to to find opportunities that we weren't able to find a couple of years ago, you know, um, coming up with smaller products, more contextual products, um, you know, products that are really relevant in a customer's journey at that moment in time. Um, but that's that's just the door in. The, the real sort of value comes with the servicing of that policy, um, you know, and when somebody does have a claim, that experience to be able to claim and you know to to get the the claim settled because um, that's ultimately you know what what somebody invests in. So I think the you're right, John. The, there's a lot of focus on the net new, um, you know, and driving new revenue. Um, but it is true there's a lot of gold mines I think out there as new technologies now come along um, to be able to look a little bit inside into the existing book of business, um, you know, and seeing how we can actually you know, not uh, expose some of that, but add more value into that. Um, you know, because again, some things that weren't available five, six years ago, now available, um, you know, data has become a lot more accessible and at least available on the surface where, you know, you can make some of these kinds of decisions of recommendations and things like that. Yeah, and, and I think to add to that, and it goes back to a little point which, you know, I was talking about where that trust in the partnership side. Right. The reality is in a lot of the embedded partnerships, the insurers are dealing with companies who are really sort of advanced technology from day one. Uh, so the way of how they expect to interact with the insurance industry is probably very different to how the insurance industry has always operated. So if you really want to maximise the relationship with those types of uh, uh, organisations, then you have to have that, obviously, API native framework as well as yeah, new technology capabilities which really can integrate with their systems because the more you can do that, the more that they're going to make you deeper into the customer segments. Right. I mean, if you look at the new fintech companies, if you look at new e-commerce companies, if you look at new mobility companies, all which, of which is Asia, new, right? right all these are new tech is, companies yeah. and very Asia, right, which we'll get to as well. But they expect to have interactions in a way that's very robust mm -hmm. and modern. Right, yeah. they have to, yeah. Yeah. The, the the thing that we've found, you know, also as a lesson learned, um, is that, you know, we, we when the whole thing started with you know enterprises and corporates dealing with startups, and you know, I say startups, but now some of these startups are you know much bigger than yeah, us. Yeah. You know, so <laughs> these these real insured techs or, or fin techs, newer companies, yeah, right? So you know, new banks and things like that, is that you know uh, uh, the sort of relationship dynamic I think have changed a little bit. And what we found that really works and resonates is is all about, you know, um, having that flexibility with partners, mm. um, understanding that, you know, our menu might not be what you want to eat tonight, mm. you know, so what can we potentially do together to be able to find you the right dish that you would want to have? So I think that is, and, and again, it's part of that relationship building. So APIs, SDKs, the technologies are all there, and if you put two engineers together, they'll figure it out. The key is the relationship, how you work together as a partnership to, to combine the forces to be able to say what, what would be valuable to our customers that we can potentially come up. Um, you know, so I think that is the, one of the major pieces that we sort of pride ourselves on is being able to be flexible with partners, um, especially tech partners, um, you know, where we know that it is, you know, the, the holy grail, this is what their business is baked on, you know, Insurance, you know, I don't know exactly what it consists of, but I'm assuming a lot of underwriting rules and actuaries. But if I'm a, I don't know, one of these super apps, a uh, Uber or a Grab, or whatever, you know, that 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 app is their business. That is it all, right? You know, so you need to really respect that mm. and understand that. Listen, this isn't just you just you know add a link into your app and there we go. It, right. it doesn't work that way. Okay, let's finish on this, and maybe John will start with <laughs> you. And then we'll end with you, Jan. Let's summarize the opportunity in Asia and the most effective ways to address that opportunity here. So I think that the, the world of insurance in Asia is obviously a tremendous opportunity, just given the macro uh, economics of every every market's got room to grow. Yeah. I think the the challenge for any uh, kind of insurance organization is really about where to focus and why you have the right to win with that focus. Right. Uh, it's like any business. It's just like you could go white, you could go after everything, but history has told us that that's been an expensive mistake for a lot of organizations, not just in insurance, but in any business, business right? right? So I, I do think that uh, 
the, the, the opportunity for all organizations is there, but there has to be a real focus about types of partners, types of customers, types of products you're comfortable with, and even how does your risk models dynamically change over time as well, right? right? I think Johan made the point earlier that each of the markets are different, right? Uh, the same risk models, the same conception about what will work from a product or even a kind of customer education point of view is very different. Right. So how do you adapt those local tactics in those markets? I think every insurer is always looking and trying to figure that out because they've realised it's it's very hard to have one fit size fits all. Almost all impossible. So the flexibility factor is there. But yeah, the, the reason why the embedded insurance space is so hot here is in Asia it's just because of that, obviously, macroeconomic opportunity. But it's not just here, I think. And Johan will probably be able to speak to that. Like if you look at Africa, right. just as big, right, and it's probably, in many ways, you could argue even more advanced in some of the kind of the, the opportunities which are emerging there. So yeah, I, I'm seeing it there. And then if we look more globally, Latin America is ripe for embedded insurance. And clearly, there's a lot of, a lot of kind of excitement in that, in that market as well. Absolutely. Johan? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, as John mentioned, I'm glad he brought up all the macroeconomics numbers and things, but at least from sort of from our side, you know, the opportunity in Asia for us, um, you know, besides just embedding in partnerships is the kind of companies obviously starting up here. Right. Um, you know, uh, hugely technology focused, um, you know, a lot of investment from, you know, various different governments, as you guys know, um, you know, to, to get guys, um, you know, to a certain level, um, you know, so a lot of quality companies actually coming up um, in Asia. But I also think the you know, it's like the danger in that as everybody is seeing the same thing um, and, you know, coming back, John, to what you mentioned on the focus, which is so important, you know, to be able to trust, you know, your direction and not to get distracted with, you know, what is the other guys doing? Because, you um, we are in a kind of an industry where everybody is looking, oh, they, they're doing this and mm. we now need to do this or they do that. And, you know, what are we going to do to do that? To trust your systems and, you know, um, you know, not to sort of fall for anything and everything. There's a lot of, um, you know, great technologies that comes up. The timing might not be the right timing. Right. Um, you know, not saying it's bad technologies, but um, might not be the greatest timing for a specific technology right but in asia again you know uh, the the huge penetration of internet the you know the massive markets that we've got um i think it's you know fits our products really well um you know and we've got such a great footprint um in in asia so it's always been a top priority for us um but so is latin america and europe actually you know so we know by the time Asia hits a certain stage, you know, it will be Europe. Then people will say, you know, Europe is the next thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so everybody is always looking towards the future. Um, I think it's taking it one day at a time and, you know, trust the process and your, your own systems and you will ultimately make it up the mountain, I, I believe. Johan Wusthuizen, the global digital CTO at Chubb, and John Briscoe, the CEO at Coherent. Thank you both so much for doing this today. Thank you very Thanks, much, Mike. Mike.